So hello, I'm Sergio Ayala with the Galt School of Archaeological Research at the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory at the J.J. Pickle Research Campus uh, here at UT Austin. I hope you're enjoying the educational video series that we're assembling together. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about stone tool technologies and demonstrate a few um, experimental uh, processes uh, that uh, can give some insight as to uh, how stone tool technologies are done, at least a little bit about that. Uh, so, first of all, I uh, just want to uh, invite you all, uh, when conditions improve, to come visit us if you're interested in uh, Paleolithic man or evolutionary science or you want to learn about uh, stone tool technologies and the prehistory of Texas. Uh, how early people were here, and um, the whole of prehistory, and, and what we understand about the stone tool record of prehistory Texas, uh, please come visit us. You can see our website at galtschool.org, and you can email each of us researchers. I am a prehistoric archaeologist. Uh, uh, I specialize in experimental archaeology, and uh, one of the main things that we try to do as archaeologists, is try to understand human behavior in the past. Um, one of the strong pathways to understanding human behavior is seeing how they problem solved. And um, one avenue to do that is to look at the stone tool record. And we have a, a rich record in North America. It seems we have uh, stone tool technologies that span at least it looks to be uh, 18,000 years old, perhaps older, uh, perhaps much older. Um, we have some sites uh, that are being investigated, some published literature that's come out recently, and some in the pipeline to be published that will be pushing that calendar back even further. Um, but um, the the results and, and the research is not totally complete on those things, but we might be looking at a at a presence in, in the Americas as early as 20 or 30,000 years ago. So, um, if you want to learn about that, come see us. We'll talk about the Galt site where, where we have done some uh, really, really great work and uh, we've, we've come to understand a lot more about uh, the Upper Paleolithic peoples and their presence here in Texas that preceded the uh, Clovis interval, which is was sort of like the the benchmark of the earliest, or the previously understood benchmark for the earliest peoples in the continent. But uh, this is no longer the case, and uh, the site that we've investigated is is adding part of uh, the understanding of uh, what those cultural uh, 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 material, what the cultural material evidence is that precedes uh, the Clovis interval and and what does it say about the hunter-gatherers of that time? Uh, do we have, uh, you know, how long does that presence last? Uh, uh, or, or how long is that presence here before Clovis? And how old does that go? Well, we have an understanding at least from the Galt site what that is. We have a very complex assemblage of stone tool technologies uh, and manufacturing evidence there at the Galt site. So come see us, uh, call us or email us and, and we can even give you a tour of the site. Now before me here is um, a little bit of a collaborative effort. Um, one of my colleagues, um, Alan Slade, is a Paleolithic archaeologist uh, and he's uh, he comes from the UK, he's been a part of our team, and he specializes in Clovis technology. And he's, he's been building up a, a great uh, a database of, of um, you could say, uh, materials related to Clovis technology, particularly products that look basically like this, these lanceolate biface uh, uh, points and he asked me to kind of go through the experimental process of demonstrating some techniques so 
I'm just going to do a few brief things that kind of uh, give a window to different phases along the manufacturing um, sequence from raw stone material, raw chippable stone, to an actual uh, point form. So just to get that process started, uh, I'm going to take basically a almost completely raw piece of material that's already been tested and what I mean by that is that it's been chipped a little bit so you can see or so I could see the quality of it on the inside and yes I'm getting some protective wear I don't want to give you some ideas uh, of doing this without protective wear especially if you're starting out um, this stuff fractures like glass it's very strong very sharp and you can get a material in, in your hand or your eye if you're not careful, especially if you're new. Um, so I'm going to put on some eyewear. But in the when we're talking about Clovis technologies, we're kind of talking about a kind of rule system or a manufacturing sequence that is very efficient, very efficient in uh, the way they reduce the mass of something large like this, let me go ahead and get some leather here, something as large like this, but very quickly reduce it down um, to a, a, in a bifacial way, meaning you're reducing both faces towards the middle and, and getting a very nice bifacial plane established, but doing that really quickly and efficiently and in a very clean way, hopefully, um, and then what you wind up with is something that is more along the lines of the, kind of like this right here, but going along the sort of like the chain of operations here. Um, and so as you peel the stone towards uh, the, the middle, you start setting up your bifacial plane. There you go, right there. And the Clovis Manor is is efficient because you're doing it not only quickly, uh, cleanly, with very big, large flake removals, but the flakes themselves, because they are large, they can be used also as as tool forms. You can uh, you can use the actual uh, flakes or even spalls, you could say, um, in in the early phases, really large spalls as actual tools. And I can show you an example of that. I've been doing some spalling, like that's a huge spall there. One could make a point right from that uh, spall itself, which was sometimes part of the strategy. But as you're reducing a big piece of stone like that, you take very big flakes off in the reduction process. And this is something that's a part of the Clovis strategy. It's not like a bunch of hundreds of little flake removals like chip, chip, chipping. Actually, it's a very strategic way of removing the mass really, really effectively. Now, in order to do that, you kind of need the right kind of stone uh, in mass and so on to be reducing things quickly. So what does that mean? So like I said, it's not like a real, you know, you're just kind of like easy chipping, uh, tiny little flakes coming off all the way down to get something like that. Now the, the Clovis approach was very, very uh, bold. I wouldn't, I don't know about aggressive, if that's the right word, but very, very bold. Uh, and doing this large spalling. So let me do some uh, samples of that. And having the right kind of percussion instrument of weight and, and density is important. That's how you spall. There we go. And begin to reduce a really large mass very quickly. There we go. 
Now the large spall, the spall itself kind of split from the force load. But those are like examples of this kind of percussion. We're moving a lot of mass very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. So you got to be successful at your angles. You got to get an idea of what you want to peel off and uh, through experience, what is successful and so on. Okay, so I just started this face, but, and there are ways to, I could keep going, and if I were to do that, I look like for my areas of opportunity that give me uh, ways to start removing this area. Um, so it's a bit of a strategy and how you sequence things that is really kind of key. I could do that now, or I can start working on this face and start thinking of how I'm going to peel this face really quickly. But I'm just doing these to kind of demonstrate the principles of this very bold uh, approach. So right now, because this cortex layer is so thick and soft, hitting it right here is not going to be so effective, so I might wait on that. It's so soft it will absorb the energy and I won't get a good flake removal. So this is just a real quick demonstration of like how you are going to kind of attack something like this in order to get a lot of mass off quickly. And this strategy, kind of getting my areas of opportunity. And there you go. Really bold maneuvers, and um, you remove so much mass quickly, establish your bifacial plane. And basically, I would just keep running my flakes in sequence like that. Like, I'm, like I've done here, and start thinning it further here, and start getting into uh, really uh, much later in the preform phase, you know, meaning the, the, uh, the, the sort of like getting all of the morphological uh, uh, traits just right. So in, in cross-section, uh, longitudinally but also laterally just right um, <clears throat> and doing it in the right manner like doing it in this bold way which I've got here uh, this basically almost went all the way to the opposite margin if I hadn't had like a small little error there that's what would happen and this one here had gone this flake removal had gone almost to the opposite side I've done some uh, removals here so you can't see the full flake scar but this is like sort of like 
reminiscent of the Clovis approach. Very bold, going all the way across the face with, with flake removals or overshooting the opposite edge and, and doing overshot flaking uh, in high frequency as, as a way to not only be efficient but at times even correct errors. So that's what this kind of technology is about. So if you want to learn more, um, <clears throat> come see us at the Galt Lab as soon as it's possible. We can do that safely here in the near future. And um, if you can, you can call us or email us. You can do uh, tours at the Galt site. And um, if you have any questions, you just let us know. I hope, I hope you're enjoying this video series and uh, look forward to, to seeing some of you. Thank you.